dawn, and there's a gentle breeze blowing a few hundred meters above this wonderland. Uh, Alapia is the wishing temple. It's where the locals go if they want to make a wish. It's a breathtaking view from an incredible vantage point above one of the world's most spectacular temple sites. Tourists aboard these hot air balloons have it almost to themselves, but perhaps not for long. I've come now because uh, I feel like it's an exciting period of immense change, and um, I wanted to to be here right now to um, spend my tourism dollars in those changes and. Uh, I also wanted to, you know, really see for myself what's going on. I feel the same way. Burma's been an important story, but incredibly difficult to cover. Now the curtain's coming up and the possibilities feel endless. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. This journey started two weeks earlier when I couldn't imagine what lay ahead. The last time I was at Rangoon International Airport for foreign correspondent, I was slinking in on a tourist visa to secretly interview legendary democracy leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Today, less than 12 months later, cameraman David Leland and I are legit, granted a relatively freewheeling visa to travel the country to assess firsthand the effects of the government's sudden, staggering democratic reforms. It's the type of journey we've never been allowed to make. And while the ability to operate openly is in itself a step forward, we're not really sure just how much freedom we'll actually have. Burma may finally be on the move now, but it's way behind its Southeast Asian neighbours. Decades of authoritarian rule with little international investment have stunted development. On our way into Rangoon, the first of many sites that remind us we're in a very different world. and you soon see just how frayed this place really is. Thank you, Mikalaba. <laughs> the poverty and dilapidation are really quite breathtaking, but then so is the potential. And in the last couple of years since I've been coming here, there really is a new energy. Perhaps it is simply hope. There's nervousness too. For as long as anyone can remember... Burma's been an unhappy place. Until very recently, political debate simply wasn't tolerated. Dissidents were jailed, the media censored, ethnic minorities brutally repressed. Now there's change, but no one knows whether it's real, and so we're going to try to find out. <laughs> Here in the old colonial capital of Rangoon, also known as Yangon, you can still find plenty of reminders that this used to be the richest country in Asia. In the early 1900s, this city was an exotic gathering point for some of the world's most famous thinkers. Then the Strand Hotel hosted the likes of literary greats Somerset Maugham and George Orwell. Like Burma, the Strand has been through so much since it was opened in the boom time of 1901. 
war, disrepair, dictatorship, not to mention a backpacker invasion and a rat infestation. Now it appears the boom is back. The hotel's the busiest it's been in more than 10 years. I guess what everyone's wondering, though, is will it last? On the road to Mandalay. As it's always been, the Strand is an oasis amid the heat and dust of Rangoon. It used to be the place to be seen when the Brits were still in charge. These days, the centre of power has shifted. Next day we're up early and on our way to the new capital, up a road that's almost empty. A toll of about six dollars puts it way beyond most Burmese, who get by on less than a dollar a day. About six years ago, the government simply upped stumps and moved to the middle of nowhere, abandoning Rangoon. No one really knows why, but the result is this, Napidor, a kind of Canberra meets Pyongyang. Right now, there aren't too many people to fill it, but if Burma takes off, that'll change. And in anticipation, the building frenzy is well and truly on. I'm Zoe. Uh, nice to meet you. You too. We're here to pick up an extra passenger, a compulsory government liaison officer, who'll be with us for the rest of our journey. Old habits die hard. And we want to talk to the president's chief advisor. Naturally, I'm expecting to meet a grim, circumspect official and record a guarded interview. That's not how it goes. Now, Myanmar is genuinely changing to a new era. It's not just reaching change. It's just change. so hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, uh, I, I don't very, mean to very hard to, Yes, very hard to believe because the things are rapidly changing. We need credibility and we need legitimacy and we need uh, to make trust between the people and the government, also political parties and the government. And this is where it's all supposed to happen, inside this extraordinary looking building. We're inside the parliament, which happens to be sitting this week. And of course, the fact that we're even in here, proof once again that doors are opening everywhere. There's a series of by-elections coming up in April. And for the first time in years, members of Aung San Suu Kyi's party, the National League for Democracy, will compete. If Aung San Suu Kyi wins a seat, as expected, she and her colleagues will be sitting here among those who repressed and jailed them for so many years. It sounds great, and, and I hope it, it's, it's real. I, I guess what the international community is wondering is, is it real, or is there an ulterior motive on the yeah. part of the government in what it's doing? Yes, actually, I think that after a long years of political statements, the both sides have realised that this road is not effective, not works. So we have to change the directions. And the destiny is, come on, the same destiny, to make goods, to make the better men of the country. Okay, so what about um, standover tactics against uh, people who have political views, uh, the jailing of people for political activity, uh, forced labour, um, forcing people to become convict porters uh, in the ethnic conflicts, uh, brutality and rape by the Burmese military. Does all that stop now? Do you, do you admit that that's been happening and is that over? Is that in the past? Okay. Actually, yes, it's like our melodies of the old age. And uh, according to the situations, uh, the stability and security is the first priority for the previous government as you know, and uh, they have used such uh, tactics, but now we are democratic elected government, so we try to treat this melody 
with a very correct uh, treatment of the democracy. So, uh, actually, you should divide uh, the previous government and uh, the new government. <laughs> During our journey, we get to see for ourselves just what that means for many Burmese. We've come to a political rally for Aung San Suu Kyi. Oh, we love Dosu so much. This time is our chance, very, very big chance to see her. Her National League for Democracy won elections way back in 1990, but was never allowed to take power and she spent long stretches under house arrest. This time, as they say, it's different. This is a campaign rally NLD style, and what's really notable about this is that these people are allowed to be here, at least in theory, and so are we. A campaign rally for Aung San Suu Kyi and her opposition, where local people can legally attend, and so can the international media, would have been unthinkable such a short time ago. Last time we, we cannot come out on the road. Now you see all, a lot of people you can see on the road. In the Burma of old, it paid to keep your political allegiances to yourself. Now people are out and proud. Just a few months ago, publishing images of Aung San Suu Kyi was illegal. Now you can wear her face around town. How many T-shirts are you selling every day? A day? Wow. Once again, we see old habits die hard. We're being watched and so's the crowd. It's not enough to deflate the enthusiasm for most, but some still fear the old consequences of being seen at a political rally. We press on regardless. We can't afford to miss that all-important shot. We want to film her get out of the car and walk. See, this is why we stand here. The presence of pushy international journalists is a side effect of democratic reform that no one's quite sure how to deal with. Finally, arriving into the heat and the dust like a cool breeze, the lady herself. It's a rock star welcome. Hello. Aung San Suu Kyi is not only taking the military on trust, she's also trying to overcome some restrictions on campaigning that appear to be designed to give government candidates an advantage. It'll take more than just courage. There are endless practical problems as well. Aung San Suu Kyi is just hitting her stride when the generator fails. But the people don't mind. And pretty soon, she's off again. She eventually departs in much the same way she arrived, and we're leaving too. I want to talk to him. Don't sue. Aung San Suu Kyi is about the only thing many people know about Burma, and we're keen to get away and into the parts of the country most people never get to see. The vast majority of Burmese live in remote rural communities, and it's like stepping back in time. They survive off the land, and the state does little for them. 
we've arrived at the village of Kondan in western Burma and while we're roaming far and wide like never before, there are some limitations. Our government mind has told us that we can't stay in the village with the local people, but we can stay at the monastery. So with the permission of the monks, that's what we plan to do. Come on. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having us. Come on, kids. The monastery's abbot has offered us a place to crash for the night. Buddha watches over us while we sleep. Each morning, the abbot tutors these young boys. Religion is one of the few areas where people can express themselves with some freedom. It offers them strength and safety. Some monks have played a brave role in Burmese political resistance. They've spoken out when the people were too afraid to, and they've been punished for it. Many were jailed after a failed revolution in 2007, and they've only recently been released. Religion has endured, and the monastery remains figuratively and literally at the centre of every community. This village is typical of those we encounter on our journey. Local chief Yulei Po explains that there's no school for older children, so they have to drop out as early as age 10 or move to a larger town. There are few community facilities or even basic services. The chief introduces me to 27-year-old Chote Ma, who's only the third person in the village to ever go to university. Five years after graduation, she's still unemployed. In a country where the military controls every single thing, it's all about who you know. Whether the regime actually passes the power to the people rather than just talking about it, will be the ultimate test of the reform program. With 60 million people and an abundance of natural resources, Burma could be a new Asian tiger. Until now, the biggest investor has been China. But if the West lifts economic sanctions, money from other countries will flood in. And along with that will come curious tourists who want to see what all the fuss is about. And they're in for a treat. 
Until now, Burma's been a niche tourist destination, despite its obvious wow factor. The Central Plain has long been known as the spiritual heart of the country, and Bagan is at the centre of the tourist trade now more than ever. Political change has brought about a tourist boom, with flights and hotels fully booked. For many here in Bagan, life has barely changed since this extraordinary temple complex was built a thousand years ago. And while for us that means lots of great photo opportunities, for the people who live here, it means a very tough life. Right, everybody, welcome to Balloons Over Began. Uh, as I said, my name is Ian, and I'm your pilot this morning. Balloons Over Began is a partly Australian owned company that's been operating here for 13 years despite military rule. Each year it caters for more tourists drawn to this extraordinary place. I guess I, somehow I had some impressions that it would be a lot more closed than it is, um, but people are willing to talk very freely to me. And um, I, people people seem to be uh, talking about having a sense of, of change themselves and, and what's coming in a no, very hopeful. And more recently, with the relaxation of the military's iron grip, the numbers have really taken off. Okay, we're climbing up now, guys. More than 80 local staff are employed by the company. It's making a big difference to the local economy. Yes, I've seen a, a lot of increasing in tourists, this year in particular. Uh, I mean, over the last couple of years, there's been indications of change um, within Myanmar. But this year in particular, we know that the hotels are full. And that's also reflected in us in the balloons because we've had lots of people to fly. He is hoping the bubble doesn't burst. And here in Bagan we say cheers, pros, salu, kampai, chin chin, <laughs> uh, a chagua, which is Burmese, and soft landings. Soft landings. Soft landings. Soft landings. Soft landings. Chagua. 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 And so, to the road to Mandalay. On the road to Mandalay. It's one of the world's legendary routes thanks to the poem by Rudyard Kipling and thanks to many more writers, musicians and filmmakers who followed, the mythology and legend has grown. But in the 21st century, it's a well-worn trail that leads to a city that's arguably the engine room of the country. Surrounded by historic old cities, it's become an economic hub propped up by Chinese money. Sadly, it's our last stop. If, as is hoped, Burma's tentative steps back into the world become strides, that bring prosperity to the people, then Mandalay will be an epicentre of a new nation. It's a big if. We've had about two weeks to complete this journey. Not long enough, but longer than we've ever had permission to stay before. Now the train is leaving Mandalay for Rangoon and it's time for us to make a run for it too before our visas expire. Finally, some time to reflect. This country has so much to offer. Natural wonders, a deep and enduring history 
and brave, hard-working and resilient people. But will they ever be allowed to reach their full potential? The train is now leaving. Everybody's on board. So nobody would like to drop out from the trains. And they know, everybody knows that the reform must be go ahead. It's clear that this place is changing fast. Who knows if the people at the top will keep their word? And what will it mean for those who until now have never had a say in their future? There's only one thing for it. Down the track, I'll just have to come back and find out. <laughs>